As you may have recognized, I'm not Rodney Livingston. I have a little bit more hair than he does. Uh, but if you can put up with me for this morning, he'll be back tonight. The Bible reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I really want us to focus in on that last verse there in, in verse 16. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The passage there is talking about spiritual wisdom, about how we can know things about Christ, we can know things about the future, or we can have earthly wisdom. We can have which the Bible counts it as foolishness in wisdom. But we have the mind of Christ, meaning that every word I say, every action I give, every decision or choice I make, every place I go, every person I affiliate with, everything in my life, I ask myself that question, what would Jesus do? I have the mind of Christ. I know through the Bible what Jesus would do, what He would decide, what He would say, how He would act. And so therefore, if I'm trying to be like Christ, I need to know what He would do. But on the flip side of that, if I know what Jesus would do, I also know what Jesus would not do. This morning I want us to notice a topic, what would Jesus not do? You see that phrase, what would Jesus do, is something that's been popular for a very long time. People have used that slogan and have made it into jewelry and bracelets and t-shirts. And, and it's been a very popular slogan, but this morning I want us to notice the opposite of that. What are some things that Jesus wouldn't do? As we're trying to be as much like Christ as possible, I want to know what He would do. But I also want to know what Jesus wouldn't say. I want to know what choice Jesus wouldn't make. I want to know where Jesus wouldn't go. I want to know what Jesus would avoid. I want to know the people Jesus would not be around because if those things are not good enough for our Lord, they're not good enough for me either. If God's going to avoid something, I want to avoid it too. What would Jesus not do this morning? I've got five things I want us to notice very quickly. We'll move through them quickly because of time's sake. But I want us to, to be very clear up front here. This lesson is not meant to limit the power of God. God is all-powerful, He's all-loving, He's all-knowing, He's almighty. And so I'm not standing up here this morning saying, you know what, God is not going to do this. God cannot do this because He's not powerful enough. He's not smart enough. He's not strong enough. And that's not what I'm saying. I believe the Bible teaches God has all power. He can do all things. And we can do all things through Him who strengthens me. But through God's Word, through the Bible, He has told us there are some things that I will not do. There are some things that I promise I'm not going to do, and I will not do those things. What are the five things that our Lord has said He will not do? And how can we apply those to our life this morning? The first thing I want us to notice is that God will not do wrong. God will not do wrong. If you think, turn over to Job chapter 34. We'll notice this passage as we begin this topic here. Job chapter 34, starting in verse 10. Here Job is sitting and he's going through all kinds of trials. He's going through all kinds of hardship in his life. We know the story of Job. And in chapter 34, one of his friends is sitting by talking to him. And his friends have offered him some interesting advice. But I love what they say in verse 10 of Job 34. Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness, and far from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his work, and he makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. There are some passages, some uh, translations that say it's impossible to think about God doing wrong. I can't even fathom in my mind God doing something that's wrong. You know, we oftentimes get caught daydreaming about things. As we sit in class, as we sit at the office, sometimes our mind begins to wonder. And here Job's friends are saying, my mind can't even daydream about God committing a sin, about God doing wrong, because it's not even possible to think about that. God will not do wrong. You think about James chapter 1. It says when we're tempted, when we go through hard times, when we have bad times in life, we can't blame those on God because only good things come from God. Nothing bad can come from Him because He cannot do wrong. As Jesus hangs on the cross, He takes on my sin, He takes on your sin, He takes on the sin of the entire world, and God has to turn His back on Him because God cannot be affiliated with sin or wrongdoing at all. But what about us? What about us? If we're striving to be like Christ, and if we're striving to not do the things Christ would not do, are we avoiding sin like our Savior did? Because He came and lived a life just like us and avoided sin completely, 100%. He did not give in to anything. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet He did not commit a wrongdoing. But oftentimes we want to push the line, don't we? 
We want to ask ourselves that question, how far is too far? How close can I get to sin without actually touching it? You know, I've always wanted to visit Australia. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe some of you would like to. Uh, But Australia is an interesting place. It's got a lot of very dangerous animals. But not only does it have dangerous animals, it's got some very dangerous plants as well. And one of those plants, you can make fun of the name, is called a gimpy gimpy tree. Now, I don't create the name, I'm just telling you about it. On this tree, if you touch the leaf, on the leaf has little hair-like structures. And these hairs cover the plant completely. And if these hair-like structures get on your skin, they have little toxins and chemicals that will get into your bloodstream. And it's not just like poison oak or poison ivy where you'll, you'll itch and scratch for a little while. These toxins get into your blood and will eventually go to your lungs. And they'll cause you to suffocate. And if you get around this plant too much, it'll wind up killing you. You may say, well, okay, I'm just going to kind of, if I see the plant, I may just walk by it. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to get close to it. But the problem is, if you walk by on a windy day, the wind will blow the hairs off of these leaves onto you. Now, the plant grows this as a protection to, against animals and against people and other things like that. But even just being in the near vicinity of this plant, you can become infected because the wind will blow these hairs on you. And that's how God is with sin. God has said, I'm not going to touch sin and I'm not even going to get anywhere close to it because it can wind up taking my life. And we have to have that same mindset as well. It's not how close can I get to it without touching it. It's I don't want to be anywhere close to it because it may not take my life physically, but sin will take my life spiritually. God cannot and will not do wrong because he's told us that in his word. It's impossible to think about God doing wrong. That's why I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. As he's beginning to conclude the book, he offers some short little pieces of advice. And there he says, test all things and hold fast to what is good. Test everything. If you're getting ready to make a decision, if you're about to try something, check out and see, would Jesus do this? Or would Jesus not do this? Avoid what's wrong. Hold fast to what is good. The second thing that we know the Bible tells us is that God will not break a promise. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. In verse 17 and 18. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge from, uh, to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Here the Hebrew writer is talking about the superiority of Christ and how we can have hope in Him. And he says God has promised it. And then in verse 18, verse 18 he kind of gives a side note here. He says God has sworn it by oath. God has promised this. Oh, and by the way, it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to break a promise. And so if God makes a promise, He's going to hold fast to that. You can think back all the way to the beginning of, of the Bible. If God has made a promise, He's kept it. He's never broken one. You talk, think about Noah. He tells Noah to build an ark of a certain size and certain, certain shape. And, and when the day comes, I will save you and your family and all those that are in the ark. God promised it. Did He do it? Yes, He did. God put a rainbow in the sky after that event and said, I promise I will never flood the entire earth by water again. He promised it. Did he do it? No, he didn't. He promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation from your descendants. And Abraham's old at the time. He doesn't even have a single child. But did God make a promise? And did God keep it? Yes, he did. You can go back and look all throughout the Bible, maybe even look at times in your life in which you have seen the promises of God be fulfilled. God has promised in the Bible, if you're a faithful child of mine, if you've been washed in the blood, if you've been baptized into Christ to walk a new life, if you are His child walking in the light, one day I'll call you home. And you'll be with me in heaven. And folks, if God's promised it, He's going to keep it. What about you? How often do we keep our word? When we say something, when we make a promise, is that something that we keep very seriously? Or do we say something and just go back and do it any other way? Are our words something that we use to fit our situation or is it something we use to to fix our life? If we say something, do we mean it or does it float through the wind as so many people do? God will not break a promise. Moving on quickly for time's sake. Number three, God will not remember a sin that He's forgiven. 
God will not remember a sin that he's forgiven. Now turn to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you notice that there? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we've been baptized into Jesus Christ... Down in verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Turn to Isaiah chapter 43. In verse 25, the Bible says, I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Here God is talking to uh, the nation of Israel. And He says, if you come back to Me, if you repent to Me, I'll forgive you of your sins and I won't bring them up again. I'll forget about them completely. I'll remember them no more. You see, once God's forgiven us of a sin, He doesn't remember it any longer. You know, sometimes it's easier for God to forgive us than for us to forgive ourselves, is it not? Sometimes we do something and we know God's forgiven us, but we just can't let it go ourselves. Or maybe even worse than that, Maybe a brother and sister in Christ has come forward and asked for forgiveness. Maybe they've done something privately between you and them and they come up to you and, and they say, Listen, I'm sorry. I hope you forgive me. I'm trying to do better. I'm, I'm trying to get my life back and straight. I know I did you wrong. I know I hurt you, but I'm sorry. And we know that God's forgiven them. But sometimes it's hard for us to forgive them, isn't it? You recall in Matthew chapter 18 as the apostles come to Jesus and they say, Lord, how many times should we forgive? Jesus said it's not about a number. It's not about a, a keeping a tally mark of how many times I give you forgiveness. If they ask, you forgive them. And you welcome them back like a Christian should. Isn't it great to know that God does the same for us? Because I know I've made my fair share of mistakes. We all have. But God doesn't just toss us out and say, I, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. Forget about you. God's always willing to bring us back. In South Florida, there's a man by the name of Sammy Luciano. He's 39 years old. Now, only 39, a young guy. Just recently, in the past couple weeks, he was arrested for the 34th time. 39 years old, he's been arrested 34 times. And these are not just minor offenses. He's got uh, charges all across the board. This last time he was arrested was because he stole a car and was driving it 130 miles down the highway. And they arrested him and put him in jail. And, and right now, the court system in Florida is trying to figure out, what do we do with Sammy? Right? We've done everything we can. He's served jail time, he's served prison time, he's paid fines, he's, he's been on every single program we can put him in. What do we do with him? Do we just lock him up and throw away the key? I don't know what they're going to do with him, but I know what God does with us. God continues to forgive. God continues to forgive. He doesn't just lock us up and throw away the key, but God will not remember a sin he has forgiven. Number four, God will not stop loving you. God will not stop loving you. There's no way in, in, in earth that God can love us any more or any less than He already does. In fact, when we take a look at the Bible, when we take a look at God's love, it's as if we've drawn a line. And that line represents God's love and He's standing on that line. And God has said, there's nothing you can do to make you love you any more and there's nothing you can do to make me love you any less. I love you the most and the least that's possible for me to love you. I'm never going to step above that line and love you any more than I love anyone else. And I'm never going to step away from that line and love you any less than I love anyone else. God's love is the standard. He does not change. In fact, the Bible in 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. By definition, that's what God is. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 paints us a picture of what that love looks like. It says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself, that's God, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And remember what we said a while ago? If God makes a promise, He keeps it, right? Because God cannot lie. He cannot go back on a promise. He's promised, I won't forget you. I won't forsake you. I won't leave you. I won't stop loving you. I won't hang you out to dry. God has says, I will love you. And there's nothing you can do to change that. The question is, do we love Him in return? 
Romans chapter 8 teaches us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And God's love, when it takes over our life, it completely changes our life. Our doctrine affects our duty. Our beliefs affect our behavior. God's love will change our lifestyle. Because I don't love the way that I would love you. I love the way that God loves you. When someone does something wrong to me, I try to show God's love to them, not my own. Because my own love will never be enough. How much do we love others? How much do we stop loving others as well? Number five and the last one this morning. God cannot stand to see someone live in a lost condition. God cannot stand to see someone live in a lost condition. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 tells us God is patient. He's long-suffering. He desires that all men should come to repentance. And that's the reason when Jesus left this earth in Matthew chapter 28, He gives a great commission to His apostles, which is also a command for us today as well, to go and teach, to save the lost. To don't just sit back on your recliner and hope someone else does, but you go, you save, you teach. But you see, the problem is this morning, we've got to make sure we are not in a lost condition before we can go save those outside. Just recently, I heard a story of a tourist group who was taking a bus tour through the country of Iceland. They were going through looking at historical towns, historical markers and monuments, and uh, it was tourists from all across the world on this bus tour. Well, they made a pit stop somewhere for, uh, to get lunch and to refuel and to refresh and things, and as they made this pit stop, a lady on the tour went inside to change clothes. I don't know why she changed clothes, but she did. And so when they were loading back up the bus, getting ready to leave, nobody recognized her because she had changed clothes. Now, I don't know what she was wearing, and I don't know what she put on, but apparently it was enough to change her appearance some way. And so as they were taking roll, making sure that everyone that got off the bus got back on the bus, they noticed they said, hey, look, we're, we're missing a lady. Well, she's not here. And so they unloaded the bus and started looking around. And this lady, who they thought was missing, was actually sitting on the bus. And so they said, well, we need everyone off the bus to come help us look for this lady. And so she gets off looking for the lady who is actually herself. She doesn't realize that. They call the police. They call in a helicopter tour. They spend hours upon hours looking for this. And finally they find a picture of the lady and start posting it up. And she looks and she says, hey, that's, that's me. I'm the person that's missing. She just changed clothes and no one realized it was her. But this is what caught my eye about that story. The news teams, of course, were all over the story, as, as crazy as it was. And they interviewed her, and this is all she said. She said, I had no idea that I was lost. I had no idea that I was missing. I was looking the entire time and I didn't realize it was me. This morning, God cannot stand to see someone live in a lost condition. Do you realize that that may be you? Have you done the things that you need to do to make sure that you're right in the eyes of God? Because there's a lot of people in the world who will teach you a lot of things about how you ought to be saved, but only God's Word teaches us the truth. Have you studied it? Have you read it? Because it's what teaches us the truth. For those of us who have been saved, are we now going out looking for others? For those of us who are walking in the light, who are children of God, are we walking out in the world looking for lost sheep to bring them into the flock? To introduce them to the good shepherd. Or are we like Jonah? You recall what Jonah did. He went and preached to the city and then he went and sat up on the hill and said, Okay, God, go destroy them. I'm sitting up here. I'm ready. I've got a good view. I want you to destroy them now. Is that the kind of attitude we have? Or are we patient with people? Continuing to encourage. Continuing to teach. Continuing to set an example. God can't stand to see someone live in a lost condition. We shouldn't be able to either. This morning, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus not do? What are some things that you need to do in your life to start pleasing God? And maybe what are some things that you don't need to do in order to start pleasing God? What are some things you need to start doing and what are some things you need to stop doing this morning? There's a man in the state of New York who's been driving his same car for a long time. In fact, on his odometer, if you look at how many miles he's driven his car, it has over 3 million miles on it. Now, when we drive a car and we hit 200,000 miles, we think it's got a lot of miles on it. His has got 3 million miles. And several people said, that's impossible. You can't drive a car that long for, for that amount of time. It's impossible for it to have that many miles. And he said, really, it actually, it's, it's, very sec it's very simple. My secret to keeping this car running for so long is you've got to read the manual. 
you got to read the manual. A lot of times we take the instruction manual and we just put it in the glove box or we carry it inside and put it on the cabinet. He says you got to read it. If you want to know how to operate your, operate your car, you've got to read the manual. If your car needs an oil change, you don't just talk about doing it, but you do it. This morning, have you read the manual? Have you read the manual of your life? And this morning, if you need an oil change, let's not just talk about doing it. Let's do it. This morning, if you need to do something spiritually to become a child of God, maybe you need to be baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away. Maybe you need just prayers of the church. You realize that there are some things you're doing in your life you need to stop doing. This morning, if we can help you spiritually, we invite you to come as we stand together and as we sing.